Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's April 1st, Wednesday, 2020. I'll give you advance notice. Number one, there are no April Fool's jokes that I'm going to try to pull on you in this podcast. And number two, regardless of the length of this podcast or any of my other episodes, you are not required to listen to the entire thing. <laughs> there is so much news today, and uh, I spent extra time today struggling to edit down the number of stories that I would bring you. And yet I recognize that it's certainly going to be more than half an hour, and you can listen in multiple sittings or sessions or you can go to my website, peterbcollins.com, and there is a show file that accompanies this podcast, and you can scan through and look at the stories that are most important to you. 90% of the time, the list is accurate, and the stories come up in order. <laughs> but there is some chaos these days, and I apologize when that doesn't happen. Back in the 1970s, that may precede some of my listeners, New York was in deep financial trouble, and they were seeking a loan from the federal government. Gerald Ford was the president, and in a, an infamous headline, it was either the Post or the Daily News that bannered in the largest possible font, Ford to New York, drop dead. And I was reminded today when our vacillating stable genius president, a reality star TV host who is just basking in the extended media coverage he gets from these ridiculous daily briefings. Well, they had floated the idea. They told us there were active discussions in the White House. This goes back a week or maybe two. That they were going to put aside their pride and uh, accept the irony that because of the pandemic, that they were going to order the 38 states that have exchanges that are part of the federal system for Obamacare, that they would set up a new open enrollment period. And this would be a lifeline to many Americans who have no health coverage at all right now, and to some because of their employment situation, who will be losing employer-subsidized or fully paid employer health care coverage. And so Trump is, in a way, telling people that his pride, his vendetta for Obama, his repeated efforts with the Tea Party Republicans to dismantle or totally kill Obamacare, that's much more important than the Americans who desperately need it right now. And so we're told a final decision has been made. The Trump administration has decided against reopening the Affordable Care Act's healthcare.gov marketplaces to new customers. This is especially cruel. And let me go back for another famous quote, and this one is from uh, Marie Antoinette. She said, let them eat cake, referring to poverty-stricken serfs in France at the time. And I guess Trump's equivalent would be, let them eat snake. Now, according to this account in the New York Times, this decision will not prevent Americans who recently lost their jobs from obtaining health insurance if they want it. Under current law, people whose job-based insurance already qualify to enroll for health insurance on the marketplaces, but are required to provide proof that they lost their coverage. A special enrollment period would have made it easier for people to enroll. But that doesn't address the needs of people who didn't have employer coverage. And you've heard Bernie Sanders say it over and over and over again. That number is in the millions. And there are complications like people who worked part-time or people who may be on COBRA, the extension of a health care plan that was part of employment. So there are 11 states in the District of Columbia that have their own health care exchanges. And here in California, they decided to open a new enrollment period. I believe it starts today, April 1st. And this is a really cruel development. 
And it shows that Trump values himself, his political future, and, of course, corporate money over the lives of too many Americans. And here's another insult, because instead of drop dead, a federal appeals court, the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans, immediately overturned the ruling by a federal judge in Texas that I shared with you yesterday that put a hold on state-level orders that because of coronavirus, what are considered to be non-essential health care procedures will not be permitted. And, of course, they opportunistically said that abortion is not essential. And as I pointed out, they don't just mean surgical abortion. They extend it to pharmaceutical abortion. RU86, day-after pills. I don't think a day-after pill uh, actually would apply in this case. But you get my point. This is another cruel, politically driven, pandering stunt to appeal to hardline conservative and evangelical voters who, of course, overlook Trump's own personal record and say, He's the man who God sent us to end abortion. And so the order essentially will require women with problem pregnancies or consider women who've lost their job. They think they may lose their home. Their finances have been turned upside down. And under Roe versus Wade, which has not been overturned yet, they have a constitutionally protected right to choose abortion. And we don't get to judge which decisions are uh, approved by individuals because of their, their faith, their politics. Nobody gets to second-guess that. That is the right to privacy that was found in the Roe versus Wade decision. And so, as the trial court judge in Texas stated in his ruling, the Constitution, I'm sorry, the Roe versus Wade decision did not have an exception for a federal emergency. So these people are making it up. And the appeals court intervened to overturn, put a hold on the ban on the ban. And this is where we are today with the political corruption and I don't know which judges on the Fifth Circuit made this decision. But we know how Trump and Mitch McConnell have been packing the courts, all with young, white males. Oh, yeah, there are a handful of minorities, a handful of women, but predominantly. These are white guys of age 50 or younger who all take a hard line against abortion. There was one dissenter at the Fifth Circuit. I, I presume it was a three-judge panel. Judge James Dennis noted that a federal judge had said, this is uh, Judge Lee Yackel in Texas, that irreparable harm would flow from allowing Texas in order to prohibit abortions and that he believed Yackel's decision should stand. And Planned Parenthood, issued a statement while people everywhere are trying to survive the pandemic. Politicians like Governor Abbott continue this perverse obsession with banning abortion. We will not cower before politicians who insist on exploiting a global pandemic to score political points. End quote. And I will add, at the expense of forcing a woman to give birth, her choice has been removed by powerful white men pandering to a political group. Yesterday, we reported about the plight of the 4,000 sailors on the USS Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier, which is now anchored in Guam. And the captain issued an SOS. His name is Brett Crozier. He said, sailors do not need to die. The Navy is failing to properly take care 
of our most trusted asset, our sailors. And he proposed that all about all but about 400 of the 4,000 sailors on the ship should be offloaded, taken ashore to be tested. Those who test positive should be treated. And the remaining 10% would tend to the nuclear reactor, secure the airplanes and the munitions that are on board, and scrub the ship. And initially, the Navy command, the brass, said, oh, no, 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 no. You know, if a few of them die, they're just data. They're just numbers. But after waves of bad publicity, the Navy brass relented, and they are now proposing to allow 2,700 of the 4,000 to leave the ship. And yesterday, the account I had indicated that there were, at that point, only three sailors who had tested positive. Well, as of Wednesday afternoon, that number is 93 testing positive and 87 more exhibiting symptoms associated with the virus. Only about 1,300 have been tested and hundreds have tested negative. Here's today's COVID-19 news roundup prepared by Linda Lewis. And first up, the numbers. The official CDC number of deaths in the United States is at 3,603. News accounts place it above 4,000. Uh, the CDC count on cases is 186,000. Worldwide, 751,000 confirmed cases and 36,405 deaths have been reported to the World Health Organization. In Spain and in Ireland, they're nationalizing private hospitals. I think that's a good thing. We could try that here, but there is a bipartisan allergy to those kinds of actions that are so dangerous to the capitalist state. And Linda notes that after weeks of false claims by Trump about the coronavirus emergency, this year's April Fool's Day feels decidedly anticlimactic. As Trump used superlatives like fantastic to praise businesses and his administration's response, new revelations uh, so uh, show that Americans are being taken for a ride, in many cases ending at a temporary morgue. And one of the most devastating lies concerns the available of PPE, personal protection equipment, including masks, ventilators, and the other protection critical to saving our frontline medical teams. And while governors all across the state are just screaming for more masks and ventilators, what we are learning is that the brisk international trade in products that are inventoried in the United States is adding to the competition for this important equipment that New York Governor Cuomo referred to as uh, like being on eBay. So we're now learning, based on a report in Politico, last week a Trump administration official working to secure protective gear had a startling encounter with counterparts in Thailand. The official asked the Thais for help, only to be informed by the puzzled voices on the other side of the line that a U.S. shipment of the same supplies, the second of two so far, was already on its way to Bangkok. Now, we know this is in pursuit of the mighty, almighty dollar, and not some sort of, you know, exchange or anything like that. So the administration has placed a moratorium on overseas shipments of USAID's stockpiles of protective gear and asking that the equipment be sent to the U.S. instead. In the last two months, at least five American embassies, Myanmar, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Laos, all announced that the U.S. government had given protective gear to their host countries. The government has yet to curtail exports by American companies, roughly 200 million, uh, 280 million masks in warehouses around the United States were purchased by foreign buyers on Monday alone, according to Forbes. 
A FEMA spokesman said the agency has not actively encouraged or discouraged U.S. companies from exporting overseas. The State Department shipped 17.8 tons of masks, uh, respirators, and other PPE to China going back as far as February 7. And in a Secretary of State news release, Quote, this assistance only adds to what the United States has done to strengthen health security programs around the world, extolling our exceptionalism and purported generosity. And six days later, with the Trump administration still downplaying the threat to the United States, the CDC confirmed the 15th American COVID case. Also at Forbes, David DeSalvo writes that millions of masks are being purchased by foreign buyers and are leaving the country. That's an article dated March 30th, Monday. And here's a quote from what I would describe as this bizarre, buzzar. What started as an early morning call with a friend to help get N95 masks to hospitals in desperate need turned into a roller coaster of contacts in a frenzied, pandemic-driven market. For the next 10 hours, I sat in on calls between brokers selling masks and potential buyers, watching the psychology of market pressures play out in real time. Buyers from state procurement departments and hospital systems expressed desperate need for masks, but the deals bogged down when it came to providing proof that they could commit and follow through. In the meantime, another buyer provided proof of funds and the masks were gone, sometimes within the hour. And it cites a report of a man receiving text updates from his network about the ever-changing quantities of masks in Houston, New Jersey, Miami, L.A., along with cities in Canada and in the United Kingdom. Quote, I was astounded by the numbers of masks at these locations. At one point, he received an update that 43 million masks were available in New Jersey. In the same time frame that federal and state leaders were saying, that they were scouring the globe. But those New Jersey masks didn't go to any domestic buyer. Instead, they were all purchased by foreign buyers. And that same source said most of the masks are leaving the country. So by the end of the day, roughly 280 million masks from warehouses around America had been purchased by foreign buyers and were earmarked to leave the country, according to that broker. And that was in just one day. And Linda cites a report from the Texas Tribune regarding substandard masks. And a company called uh, an, an industrial supplier, Hatfield & Company, is ready to sell as many 2 million masks to a major U.S. oil company, and it wasn't your typical offer. The Texas-based supplier wanted $6.3 million for a minimum order of a million uh, masks with an option of buying 2 million more for about $13 million. And in typical times, these masks, the first-line ones, the certified and non-expired ones, cost less than a dollar. And Linda also notes, by law, masks, along with other medical devices, can't be imported or sold in the U.S. without the FDA's approval. Then we turn to ventilators. In 2015, the federal government hired a Pennsylvania company to build inexpensive, easy-to-use ventilators for the national stockpile. But five years later, not a single one has been delivered, according to ProPublica. But the firm is conducting a lively business, selling them commercially. Health and Human Services signed a $14 million contract five years ago with a U.S. subsidiary of the Dutch company Philips to make these low-cost portable ventilators. Using those taxpayer dollars, the company came up with the Trilogy Evo Universal Ventilator. HHS ordered 10,000 of them in September of 2019 for the strategic national stockpile at a cost of about $3,200 each. Global competition has only increased. The regional government of Madrid bought 10 Trilogy units from a a Spanish broker for about $11,000 each. 
The Staten Island Medical Supply Store saw its initial 50-unit order sell out, even though it had hiked its price from $12,500 to seventeen grand. So this profiteering is quite a pattern, and it infects the badly needed, particularly in New York, ventilators and protective gear. It's just so disgusting. We also see that there is a new report on the appointed Senator Kelly Leffler from Georgia. She's the one who's married to the guy who runs the New York Stock Exchange. She said that she didn't have anything to do with those questionable trades after she attended briefings about the severity projected for the pandemic. And she and her husband bought stock in a company that makes protective garments. It was one of several transactions under scrutiny. And it's just more ugly evidence that the rich will get richer and, you know, not too interested in much else. From the New York Times today, reporting there was growing concern that the $2 trillion stimulus package from last week could be insufficient. I certainly agree with that. And as I pointed out yesterday, it's Mitch McConnell who is resisting the plan to borrow more trillions of dollars. And part of it would go to an infrastructure improvement project. Now, we badly need that. There are a lot of bridges and roadways that are crumbling. And there's other infrastructure like waterworks, uh, It's a little stretch to include rural broadband in there. But these are intended to help restart the economy whenever that becomes possible. And I only listened to Rush Limbaugh for about five minutes this morning. But he was arguing that it's the greedy Democrats who came up with the idea for infrastructure and that Trump is just trying to ace them out. Apparently Mitch McConnell didn't get that memo. (laughs) But from my knowledge, Trump has been calling for an infrastructure package, going back to the campaign, and he even cobbled together some weird scheme with the Saudis where they were going to set up a U.S. infrastructure fund and then, you know, they'd own a bridge in Indiana. Brilliant. I don't think that ever came together. And speaking of this important equipment, A separate article from the Washington Post today, the government's emergency stockpile of respirator masks, gloves, and other supplies is nearly exhausted. Of course, so much of that gear is out there on the open market. DHS, Homeland Security, they say, well, the stockpile was never intended for a 50-state response. You know, a flood here, a tornado there, a hurricane anywhere but Puerto Rico, and they'd be prepared to respond. And the Post notes that the government already has $16 billion budgeted to acquire more gear. And some of that uh, money is out there, as Cuomo has said, competing with the states and with individual health care districts and hospitals, all angling for the same very important gear. And I'm not a big fan of David Leonhardt, opinion writer at the Washington, uh, he's at the uh, New York Times. But he correctly declares that in part because of bad public advice that came from Anthony Fauci and the CDC regarding whether average people should be wearing masks. You know, we were told earlier it wouldn't really make much difference. Only people who are showing symptoms should wear a mask so they don't cough it onto others. But now that advice has been revised, and they're saying, well, you know, it's better safe than sorry. But they're afraid to recommend that everybody get and wear a mask because it will impact the supply that has been depleted by the profiteering and exploitation. Here in California, Governor Newsom has announced that they're going to expedite the release of about 3,500 inmates in the state prison system to try to reduce the massive overcrowding, we still, despite a court order and a sharp reduction in the prison population, 
are operating at 134% of capacity. And I generally support the moves of Governor Newsom, but he's afraid of a Willie Horton case. And there are legitimate concerns about releasing people who have nowhere to go, no resources, leaving prison, and left to their own devices, bad things could happen. But I think with even this 3,500 people who are going to be released early, there should be additional resources to make sure that they have a place to stay and that they have support to prevent them from uh, engaging in new crimes. And this is a dismal report from The Intercept today. New York City has done almost nothing to protect 70,000 people in its homeless shelters from coronavirus spread. Now, while Andrew Cuomo gets high marks for his handling of the crisis... He appears to be able to overlook the least among us, despite their visible presence on the streets of New York and across his state. But in New York alone, there are about, uh, well, at least 99 people living in shelters have tested positive for the virus. And when you have a family living together in one room and one of them becomes infected, there is no way to quarantine and to isolate, to protect those who remain healthy. The one positive note is that the city has a plan to secure 500 hotel rooms for the 75,000 homeless people, or 70,000 identified, to fight over. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis has relented. And he's saying now, well, it's okay because Trump extended his measures. They're, they're not equivalent to what the states are doing. But he extended his measures for the next 30 days. And so Ron DeSantis, a Trump <laughs> uh, lackey, has uh, finally imposed one across the state of Florida. The numbers in New York, 44,000 confirmed cases. 1,139 deaths as of Wednesday morning. The majority of victims do have underlying illnesses like diabetes, lung disease, and cancer. That uh, really frames the Darwinian nature of this virus and of the response that we're seeing. And I was struck by this alleged news article loaded with bias in the Washington Post today. Now, I have just learned from this article that Trump talked to his good buddy, Vladimir Putin, on Monday. And Putin offered to send a plane load of uh, protective gear. Now, the details are fuzzy. We don't know what kind of equipment is on the plane, how much of it. But it is Russia's largest cargo plane. Oh, it says it's the world's biggest cargo plane. Hey, how could that happen? How could we allow Russia to have a bigger cargo plane than one of ours? Anyway, the flight apparently is en route. It uh, refueled in Ireland, I think. And the concern is about the optics. And that by accepting help from Russia, that we are demeaning ourselves and that we are handing Putin a propaganda victory. This is so misplaced, but it's consistent with the Russophobia that we have seen in huge measure for the last uh, three or four years. And this article, too, amused me because the headline in the Washington Post, written by their media critic or media writer, Eric Wemple, reads, CNN, MSNBC refused to carry full Trump cor uh, coronavirus briefing. Yay! Well, <laughs> Trump rambled on, we're told, for about uh, two hours Tuesday evening. And after 100 minutes, that's 20 minutes before it ended, MSNBC courageously pulled the plug and went back to Ari Melber's show. And CNN apparently zipped in and out, but carried the bulk of Trump's 
self-aggrandizing presentation. I guess that's a little progress, but they need to simply pull the plug. No live coverage. You record it, and you pull out all of the bullshit. All of that self-promotion, all of the kiss-up that everybody who takes the stage with Trump has to deliver. And just bring us the facts. And we don't even need to see Trump to get the facts. Put it up in screen text. This is what Trump said today that you need to know. The rest of it <laughs> is simply free promotion. And, of course, it you know solidifies his connection to his base. Anybody who doesn't support Trump isn't likely to change their view, but people are hunkered down at home. Many people are deeply fearful. And they turn to the guy who's supposed to be our leader. And the networks just feed them so much crap. Now, there has been a run on various forms of uh, oxyhydrochloroquine. Let me get that right. Hydroxychloroquine. And this is a drug that medical professionals think might have some promise to treat, not to cure, this novel coronavirus. And at the same time that China is being accused by the government of suppress by our government of suppressing the death toll in China, and I I admit that that <laughs> is likely, if not true. But it's not a convenient time to be demonizing China, when it's really helpful to get their data. And use of hydroxychloroquine, according to an initial report from China this week, has helped to speed the recovery of a small number of patients who are mildly ill from the coronavirus. Now, keep in mind that while the drug may sh show some promise and maybe creating, using it as the, uh, the vodka in a cocktail might actually produce something that is a solid treatment and a potential cure, that Trump's touting of the drug has led to a run on it. And I won't embarrass this person by name, but one of my Facebook friends in Michigan launched a petition critical of Governor Gretchen Whitmer based on misinformation about moves that Governor Whitmer took. She issued an order blocking physicians from prescribing the, the drug to friends and family using a kind of medical insider trading. And my Facebook friend was uh, schooled by other people and stuck to her position nonetheless. And she is a frequent Fox viewer and uh, a Trump supporter. Over at ConsortiumNews.com today, an interesting piece by Greg Godels. He's a blogger. And he cites a number of uh, official news sources like Bloomberg News and other outlets that bring us the views of the oligarchs, the billionaires who run corporate America. Oh, people like uh, David Nealman. He's a founder of JetBlue and WestJet. You know, there's too much confusion. Nobody has jobs. People are losing their houses. Kids are home from school. What we're doing today, we have the worst of all worlds. Bill Hurley, a general partner in Benchmark Capital. He's one of those people who wants to get the serfs back on the job because of the likely damage to the economy corporate America, and the fortunes of the 1%. Here's Bill Ackman, a billionaire hedge fund manager, quoted on CNN, do we risk sort of dragging this out and really crushing capitalism if we can't fix it now and then move on and have it behind us? Yes. He advocates a rip the Band-Aid off strategy. And this kind of contempt and... Uh, dismissal of the interests of the serfs, it just shows the values 
of the uber-rich in this company. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. People like Jerry in southeast Portland, David Brown, who's my office neighbor here, Siri Walgren, the talented artist in Northern California, and Catherine Hemnes. I thank you all for your support of this podcast and invite others to visit peterbcollins.com forward slash sign up where your options for supporting the show are right in front of you. Oh, and if you don't like PayPal and you want to avoid using that system, you can correspond with me at my P.O. Box, number 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. And for several days now, I've written myself a note on my tip sheet here that I wanted to recommend to you the new Bob Dylan song. It's called A Murder Most Foul. And with over 70 references to uh, musics, you know, songs of the 60s and other cultural touch points, I believe it's a masterpiece that underscores the valid- validity of the Nobel Prize for Literature that he was awarded a couple of years ago. The song title originates from Hamlet, and it is a really, <laughs> how can I put it, uh, important set of statements about the Kennedy assassination, JFK, and its aftermath. We get correspondence here at the Peter B. Collins Show. Here's two cents from our loyal listener, John Zwiebel in Hawaii, who tells me he listens all the way to the end of every show. And he's critical of my Monday episode. That would have been on uh, March 30th. He said you spent too much time on Trump. Everything you said was true, but you didn't touch the oligarchy at all. You didn't touch the Democratic betrayal of the COVID stimulus bill. I I, I spent all last week talking about that. (laughs) What you did was attack Trump, leaving Trump true believers to discount everything else you say. Well, John, let me put this out to the entire audience here. And if you are a Trump true believer and you listen to this podcast... Would you send me an email? I promise not to reveal your name, and I won't write you back and argue with you. But I'd like to know if there is even one true blue Trump supporter who is a regular listener to this podcast. My email, peter at peterbcollins.com. He also, uh, John writes, Do you ever access Quora occasionally? Thousands are asking about how they get their $1,200. Hundreds are asking why the Democrats hate Trump. A few are pointing fingers at Trump. No one is talking about the oligarchy, which owns both the Democrats and Republicans, and which is going to buy up everything with their free $5 trillion given to them by Steve Mnuchin. So I understand your point, John. But let me explain how I do this every day. I survey major media outlets many independent media outlets. I review commentary often sent to me by listeners like you. And I put together what I think is important for people to know about. And I add my unvarnished opinions. And I've talked a lot about oligarchy. I've talked a lot about the corruption of both parties, about the ugly horse trading in the bailout and stimulus package. And I have criticized both parties quite frequently. So I appreciate your opinion. And I I don't uh, bristle at criticism from anyone, including this next one from William Janetta. He says, I've been listening for years. Don't always agree 100 percent. I appreciate your skepticism of certain mainstream ideas. So I'm wondering why I haven't heard any skepticism of the corporate media stoked pandemic fear resulting in a potentially economic depression. Inducing, oh, economic depression inducing shutdown. Well, I have talked about it. I have criticized the media. But at this point, I think it's more important to discuss the critical issues and the threats to human life. And Janetta says, I don't deny that coronavirus is serious. Personally, I hate these restrictions on freedom of movement, and I continue to question the necessity of the extreme shutdown. Well, you may. 
I don't. I think that Governor Newsom here in California, who led the effort to get people to stay at home, was actually a little bit late, and he waited for the health leaders in the Bay Area, I think, to provide some political cover. That said, I know it's uncomfortable staying at home, but I think it's the wisest thing to do under the circumstances. And I have raised questions about the use of surveillance, the creeping police state, the injection of fear. And so I I think that I have generally addressed these, and obviously it hasn't been enough for you. The final thing I'll say is that I can't presume that William Janetta or anybody else listens to everything I put out. And so if you heard my interview a week ago with Tony Platt, the radical criminologist, we discussed how this episode is being used, in my view, to inject fear into the American populace to promote learned helplessness, just like they do every day at the airport. So, those are my comments, and please feel free to criticize me and send your comments to Peter at PeterBCollins.com. So Iran is getting desperate. They really need humanitarian aid. And despite the claim by the Trump government that the sanctions do permit humanitarian aid, the secondary sanctions on the banking system, blocking any transactions with Iran, essentially make the humanitarian aid clause meaningless. And so Iran has gone to the United Nations asking for relief from the sanctions, at least for humanitarian aid, And nearly three dozen members of the U.S. Congress have appealed to the administration to suspend the sanctions for as long as the pandemic continues. But Mike Pompeo says that Iran's concerted effort to lift sanctions isn't about fighting the pandemic. It's about cash for the regime leaders. Now, I I just think that that is cruel and uninformed. It's a very different government. Yes, the Ayatollah is a supreme leader. It's a theocratic, uh, totalitarian, uh, in, in some ways, a totalitarian state. They have uh, elections for show, but only candidates approved by the mullahs are permitted. At the same time, the foreign minister of Iran is accusing the United States of waging medical terror. And the State Department tweets back, stop lying, it's not the sanctions, it's the regime. (laughs) Well, you can argue with the government. It's called a regime because we want it gone. But they're human beings. And they are caught in the middle. And the United States once again shows that they're expendable in pursuit of our hardline foreign policy. And when it's about Iran... It's really driven by Israel. Meanwhile, Trump has dark tweeted with a bully-like threat, citing no specific evidence that Iran or its backed militias, its proxies in Iraq, are planning a sneak attack on U.S. troops or assets in Iraq. And he warned, as he loves to, that Iran would pay a very heavy price if it were carried out. Now, there are reports of increasing attacks on U.S. facilities and personnel in Iraq. And, of course, if we didn't maintain the limited occupation that we have today, they wouldn't be there to be targets. But we never can admit that because (laughs) that is inconvenient to our America First policies. And in the voice of a Washington Post reporter, as tensions simmer, the Pentagon has beefed up defenses at Iraqi military bases hosting U.S. troops. It has deployed Patriot missile defense batteries at two locations. And those are all for show. We know that uh, these anti-missile defenses only work like 5 or 10 percent of the time. I want to note that Alan McLeod of Impress News has added more detail to the Pompeo-Abrams plan to essentially dictate to Venezuela, regime change to please the United States, lift the sanctions, get 
Crisis funding from the IMF that will further restructure the economy away from that dreaded socialism. The U.S. is also demanding that all foreign security forces depart immediately. That's not the Colombian death squads. It's the Cuban security advisors and doctors. And in addition, the plans are tilted to favor the National Assembly. And this is a bipartisan blunder. Nancy Pelosi often cites that the National Assembly is the only democratic institution there, dismissing the elections that international observers called legitimate that re-elected Maduro in 2018. But the National Assembly is the opposition, and they have not been in power since the 1990s when Hugo Chavez rose to power. And so this is a complete rewrite of the Venezuelan narrative to suit the United States. And (laughs) it's just another ugly move, weaponizing the novel coronavirus. In other news, a large haul of drugs, including opioids, methamphetamine, and cocaine, being smuggled from Mexico to California, was seized from a cross-border tunnel, equipped with ventilation, lighting, and an underground rail system, The tunnel runs about 2,000 feet from Tijuana to San Diego. The average depth is 31 feet below the ground. It's about 3 feet wide, and it has a little rail system. So a couple of points here. In the uh, middle of the tunnel is some kind of a warehouse, and the discovery of the tunnel a couple of weeks ago netted 1,300 pounds of cocaine, 86 pounds of meth, 17 pounds of heroin, 3,000 pounds of marijuana, and 2 pounds of fentanyl. So the market has shifted. It used to be all weed. And now they are trying to feed the black market for opioids because of the drastic cutback of legal prescription opioids in this country. And it points up the folly of Trump's wall. He can build that wall all the way across the southern border, and they're going to find spots to tunnel under. They're going to burrow through the wall, and it's just a fantasy. The New York Times continues its Barry Bernie effort. Today's report is a series of interviews with people who were part of the Democratic wave of boomers who felt it so necessary to stop Bernie Sanders from getting the Democratic nomination. And this shows media brainwashing, the fear that a socialist candidate couldn't beat Trump, when all the surveys that I've seen show that Sanders is a more potent opponent to Trump than Joe Biden. In phone interviews, says the Times, dozens of Democrats, 50 or over, who live in key key March primary states like Massachusetts, Virginia, Michigan, and Florida, said that Biden's appeal went beyond his case for beating Trump. It was his chances of beating Sanders. And that shows the, pardon my French, fucked up state of the Democratic Party today. And as Joe Biden goes from one (laughs) bad performance to the next, most recently saying that despite the Medicare for all that essentially is reflected short-term in the bailout and stimulus package that he just doesn't see how it would work. And he told Brian Williams on MSNBC last night that he doubts that there is going to be a July Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee. And, of course, that would make it easier to make the deals in the back rooms. They used to be smoke-filled. Now they're not. And thrust a very weak and vulnerable candidate on the Democratic Party. And I am not afraid to keep mentioning that the recent accusations that I find credible from Tara Reid continue to be blacked out in the corporate media as they fawn over Biden, they cover up his flaws, and they ignore these accusations. The Trumpers are not ignoring them, and there will be a price to pay. Now, speaking of Wisconsin, the state, driven by Republican-dominated houses of the legislature, is insisting on holding its primary election next Tuesday. 
Even though more than 100 municipalities will not have enough poll workers to open a single voting location. And there are many people who are unable to comply with the rules to submit an absentee ballot because they're now in isolation and Wisconsin requires a witness to submit an absentee ballot. Now, I don't oppose the witness effort. I think it's a good way to fight the gaming of mail-in voting. But it's the best reason to delay the elections, as so many other states have. More than 60 percent or 800 of Wisconsin's jurisdictions are reported they're short short of a total of 7,000 poll workers because they don't want to go out and expose themselves potentially to the virus. And so this is another clear effort at voter suppression. It originates with the Republicans, but at least the allegation coming from the Republican State House Speaker Robin Voss is that Democratic Governor Tony Evers has not pushed to postpone the election. And I don't know his politics, but I imagine he's more of a Biden guy than a Bernie guy. And Sanders has uh, said people should not be forced to put their lives on the line to vote, which is why 15 states are following the advice of public health experts delaying their elections. We urge Wisconsin to join them. And lawsuits have been filed. We will see if they are successful. And finally today, Trump blurted it out just by, like many other Republicans have. He was talking to his pals at Foxy Friends. And he referenced proposals that Democrats in the stimulus bill wanted to add, and this is Amy Klobuchar's effort, uh, a lot more money than the $400 million that they secured to create a national vote-by-mail option. And Trump said the things they had in there were crazy. They had things, levels of voting, that if you ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. That is an admission that voter suppression is the only way that this minority party gains majority status in state houses and in places like the U.S. Senate. And he's admitting that it's the only way they can win, which is by cheating. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You can share it with absolutely everybody, including Trump supporters. You'll find it on YouTube, and I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until.